So we've been in Acts chapter 13, and we've been seeing the gospel go uh, to the Gentiles with the headquarters at Antioch. Uh, we left off with uh, Antioch and Pisidia, and we've got Paul and Barnabas, and it's uh, his first missionary journey. But before we go there, I want to talk to just the theme of today's message, and it basically has to do with um, what are you looking at today? What are you allowing your eyes to see and, and your heart to connect to with what you look at? And I have to say that my example this morning, I did post on Facebook last night because it's kind of a dubious example, but, and I don't think she's in the sanctuary, but I guess somebody was checking out my daughter last night at Taco Bell. <laughs> and oh, the feelings of a parent. Oh, the anger. Oh, what a dad wants to do to an unsuspecting Taco Bell employee. <laughs> Wasn't the first time, though, that I heard a, a report yesterday about somebody looking at her. And um, it just uh, kind of gives you perspective because, um, you know, there are things in this life that we can control, right? There are things that are out of our hands, and we cannot be with our kids 24-7, to protect them from the things of this world. But what we can do and what we do do is we give them Jesus Christ and we give them his word. And so I was looking at Mark 10, 21 this morning with Jesus and the rich young ruler. And it's interesting in that situation and what caught my attention was that Jesus looks at this guy, and he's young, and he's got power. He's got money. He's got influence. But what he says to him, and, and just the one part I want to focus on, it says that he looks at him, and he loves him. And Jesus is able to do that, and yet at the same way, tell him truth. And he tells him, because he's able to, like a heart surgeon, diagnose the main issue that's within that rich young ruler and say this is the one thing that you lack and you take all your goods and you give them to the poor and you can follow me. But what occurs to me, and I know that this occurs to you in your week and in the life that you live, is that there are a lot of things that we look at in the course of a day and there are a lot of things that we allow to, that, that we meditate and think about in our hearts. And what's important? What's worthy of our consideration? And it's funny, we get together on Sunday mornings and we pray. And we talk about our week and we talk about what's going on and we, we want to know with the guys that are gathered together how we can be praying for each other. But I was just thinking about, and I was looking at Job 31, and I apologize if I'm all over the place here this morning. But for young men, for any, really any men, uh, Job 31.1 is a, is a crucial verse because it says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I look upon a young woman? And we know that Job in the Old Testament was one of the most righteous men. I think it's Ezekiel 41.14 or 14.41 talks about that. But I guess, and I know that you have this happen, as you're reading devotionally, isn't it interesting how God illuminates or reveals to you some part of scripture, even though you've read it, even though you've combed through it and, you, and, you've, and you've viewed it, he just awakens verses and they just mean something to you. And, and having read uh, Job 31 several times, I got down to verse seven and it says, if my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes. And it just made me think about, okay, in Acts 14 this morning, we're going to see men that are taking the gospel to the Gentiles and they're going to possibly die for that cause, for that sake. And, th and that's a lot. It is an interesting, like I mentioned Facebook, how uh, social media or news or movies or even songs, um, we read about endurance you remember that story about there's that guy, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he, uh, he was in charge of lighting the schoolroom uh, stove, I believe, and, and there was a fire, and uh, a large percentage of his body was burned. And, and he ended up, through endurance, 
and steadfastness, becoming uh, one of the, um, the fastest men in the world to, to run, you know, so many miles. And you think, wow, that's incredible endurance. In the context of Acts chapter 14, however, we're looking at endurance for other people. And that has so much more meaning. There are things that you and I, and I don't know how you feel when you get together on a Sunday morning. Sometimes we get together and it's kind of like your shoulders kind of slump down and you're like, oh, we made it through another week. <laughs> you know? Especially if you're older. If you're young, you're thinking, I made it through another day. I'm amazing. I'm Superman. Not at 48. <laughs> you're thinking, I made it through another week, Okay. But oftentimes, and, and it's easy to forget, what's important about endurance is investing in other people. The most precious commodity there is, others. And the endurance we're going to look at, the way that Paul and Barnabas and company overcome amazing odds to the point where, I can only imagine death by stoning is just not one of the top ten ways you want to go. You know, I'm thinking... In my sleep, die from medication, that sounds fun, <laughs> or funner. Death by stoning, not so much. <laughs> and yet, Acts 1.8, when Jesus says that you're going to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, isn't it funny that he meant it? He didn't just say that. He didn't say that to the disciples like, you know, buck up a little camper, you know, I'm leaving, but here's some, here's some happy thoughts. He says in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that, my friends, is what we're looking at today. We're not talking about nominal Christianity where it's like, well, we'll get together for Easter and maybe Christmas, have the folks over, talk about some spiritual stories, maybe, maybe mention Jesus. No, these guys have been changed for the kingdom of God. And I just want to say this morning, maybe offer up just a, uh, after, especially after doing worship, just a prayer of thanks for every person that has invested in me. You know? And how about you? How about the, just to think for a second and just to thank the Lord for everybody who took the time to talk to you and cared enough to get out of their comfort zone, their busyness, their life, their week, and thought, you know what, Joe? You know what, Bruce? You're important enough. You're valuable enough. Jeremy, I care about you enough where I'm going to tell you about the living God. Where would we be without our Jesus? Amen? Amen. So, yeah, we don't have a lot of time, but we're in Acts 14, and Paul and company and Barnabas um, have encountered a lot of opposition because they're doing what God has called them to do. And we know that that's a part of the Christian experience, opposition, okay? So in Acts chapter 14, we're going to go and we're going to travel uh, from uh, Antioch of Pisidia, and we're going to move, and, and the main city that we're going to look at today is Iconium. Let's say that together. Iconium. All right, just making sure we're all awake. So, and if you're not, it's okay. If you're going to sleep someplace, you can sleep in church. Just do the holy nod. So, they started off in Antioch in Syria, up north, and then Paul and Bartimaeus went down to Seleucia. They set sail to the island of Cyprus and landed at Salamis. From Salamis, they made their way across the island to the west, which was the main city of Paphos, uh, where they had their first convert. Uh, that was Sergius, just fun to say. After leaving Paphos, they set sail northwest toward Galatia, which is where we've been. And that's where the first missionary journey really takes wings. So again, the city of our focus this morning is Iconium. Uh, they go from Antioch and Pisidia to Iconium, and from there uh, to Lystra, Derby, uh, where they have some problems. And then after that, they decide to go back through all the towns that they had just evangelized and establish disciples in and where they had been beaten up, hassled, and then going back to Antioch. But what we get to see again is incredible endurance. Uh, nothing gets these guys down. I love that. 
And there's plenty that could get them down. And there's much that we can learn from these guys because, you know, we're on a walk, we're on a journey with the Lord. Um, endurance has been defined as the ability to keep doing something difficult, unpleasant, or painful for a long time. And I will make no jokes regarding country music whatsoever, okay? Nothing. About my endurance for that, I will not say anything, especially since there's a country music DJ that sometimes frequents this church, so I will not say anything. Moving on. Even though these guys get beat up, they go back, they go at it again, nothing keeps them down. And you think, you know what? What on earth can stop these guys? And the truth of the matter is, is that nothing on earth can stop them. They've got the power of the living God. And again, it's the promise that the Holy Spirit would be with them. So it's great reading about Paul, Barnabas. We're going to read later about Silas, uh, John, Mark, because the God in heaven is dwelling in them. So let's go ahead and begin. And I'm just going to read uh, the first 18 verses of uh, Acts chapter 14. It says, Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who is bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of uh, Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, <laughs> said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But this, this um, I don't know, this gets me, beginning of verse 14. When the apostles, uh, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So, yeah, a lot's going on here. And uh, Iconium is a, is a large metropolitan city. Um, it's interesting to me that um, in chapter 13, uh, Paul did what we said last week um, is an established pattern in that they would go to a city and they would look for the synagogue and he would go in and he would preach. And uh, so he does that. But it's interesting that he got ran out of the synagogue in uh, Antioch uh, previously in Pisidia and yet he goes again. And, uh, you know, it says a lot about a person's calling to be able to do that. Because think about how we deal with rejection. You know, a lot of times... Um, isn't it hard not to take things personally when you're sharing with somebody, you get up the courage, God fills you with boldness, and you go and you preach and you share with somebody, and they don't want to hear it. In this case, they not only didn't want to hear it, they ran them out of the city. So it takes uh, something supernatural working in the natural. But again, in verse 1 of 14, it says that uh, it happened in Iconium. They went together to the synagogue of the Jews. And so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. 
But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So some of these Jews uh, were actually not disbelievers, but misbelievers. Because, you know, you and I, we're, we're largely Gentiles here this morning. So we forget that Jewish heritage, all that time, all the sacrifices, all the amazing examples of people from the Bible that were Jewish. And so on the one hand, you've got some genuine people that are like, look, okay, you guys are converts. You know, you should get circumcised or you should keep a kosher diet. So you've got some people that are genuine in trying to help believers. And they probably would have tried to get them to keep the Sabbath. But you also have people that are antagonistic. They're going to weigh them down. And when we get to chapter 15, there's going to be what's called the Jerusalem Council, and they're going to deal with that. And, and of course, we know about uh, from the book of Galatians that this is really uh, the formation of the Judaizers. But you and I today, we're in St. Joe, 2015, August. We need to be able to have the book of Acts in our lives today, right? We need to be able to assimilate this, this font, these words, the word of God into our lives. And so I'm thinking, you know, what are Judaizers today? Okay? Somebody tries to tell you that salvation is anything other than grace, saved by faith, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that God, that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead. Okay? That's a, that's a legalistic Judaizing type of a thing, right? Sometimes some people will teach baptismal regeneration, that you are not saved until you get baptized, but that's not what the scripture says. But I want to suggest to you, too, that with the people that we rub elbows with, a lot of times man tries to add things to those books in your hands, okay? Sometimes they're going to try to women, tell women that you can't wear makeup, uh, that you can't wear wedding rings, uh, that women can't wear pants. There's a lot of things that have been probably added, and possibly with good intentions, but it's not in the Word of God. And so for you and I, don't you find in your daily walk that it's so important to keep the main things the plain things, okay? So that's the situation here. You've got people that even though a work is doing, and we see both Jew and Gentile getting saved, and yet you've got people that come in and try to drag believers under the law. Now, I got to tell you that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. We don't need to be dragged under the law. It's so refreshing to know. And I don't think that I knew that growing up. I think that I thought, well, you come into church, it's just a list of rules and regulations. You know, you just have to be a good person. If you quit drinking, you quit cussing, well, then it's time to go to church. No. No. <laughs> That's why we're here, because <laughs> we want to drink, we want to cuss. Amen. <laughs> and you don't get well before you see the physician. So, uh, reading on, verse 3, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So, look at how these guys are persevering, okay? Okay. Um, I want to speak, though, to what um, I think a lot of us see on Christian television, which is, is a lot of hype and a lot of bogusness. And, and I think Calvary Chapel has really strove to do so much more um, on the radio because of it. But what we often see today is that people try to use the Word of God to justify kind of strange behavior, okay? Um, and I want to talk specifically about healing ministries that you see. And you, and you see they go across the country and they advertise and they coerce people to come into these uh, events. But, you know, most of the time there isn't a genuine documented healing that's occurred in those scenarios. And the truth of the matter is, is that if it's really about Jesus Christ and it's really about the Word of God and it's really biblical, then just go to the hospitals, <laughs> Right? Just go where the hurting people are. Go to where people, you know, are under the bridges and, and they're in alcoholism, you know, and go to, just go to where the sick people are and you don't need to charge money. You don't have to put on a cape. You don't have to slap people's foreheads so that they fall down. You just go and you just do it because you're compelled by what God has called you to do, right? Now, having said that, healings happen. And they happen today. 
Uh, K.P. Yohannan, the founder of Gospel for Asia, has attested to people uh, raised from the dead on the mission field. One guy was raised after being dead for 10 days. That's, that's the power of Jesus Christ. So the hard thing is that sometimes we pray and the Lord will take an individual home or that person will go through a long-term health problem, but God does heal. And here, wonderfully, it's the Lord granting signs and wonders, wonders and it's to bear witness of the word of God. And that's, that's the important point to know, okay? In verse 3, remember, therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who is bearing witness to the word of his grace and then granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So it's always going to point to the word of God. Okay, reading on verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. So what we're going to see in this chapter is that there's a time to stay and preach, and there's a time to flee. <laughs> this is the time to flee. And the way that you know that is that you've got to be in tune with the Spirit, right? And you've got to be seeking God. And I'm thinking when it comes to getting, st getting stoned, <laughs> dying, their, their prayers were definitely earnest. But they flee from Iconium to Lystra and, and then on to Derbe. Uh, this is the whole area of Galatia. It's about 3,500 foot above uh, Pamphylia uh, where they came on shore. And a lot of people, scholars and uh, commentators, think that Paul may have contracted malaria. Uh, we know that we read uh, in Galatia that he talks about having, uh, his letter to the Galatians he talks about having eye problems. So um, he may have gone to a, a higher plateau. Um, but they're being chased in this situation. Have you ever been chased? <laughs> like running for your life? Um, I'm, you know, I've, I've ran, but um, yeah, I'm not going to go there. So <laughs> I've been chased, but they were not for reasons that a pastor wants to share on a Sunday morning in front of a church. So that's when I was a teenager. We'll let that go. So these guys got to go about 40 to 50 miles. We don't know what amount they're running, but adrenaline kicks in. And you think you're tired, but you don't care because people are trying to kill you. That's the scenario they're in. Verse 7. They're preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, and he's a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. So this is the third crippled person that we're going to read about in the book of Acts. Remember the first one was the guy who was at the beautiful gate. And then we read about Aeneas in chapter 9 near Jerusalem uh, when Paul's traveling to Joppa. This one's extremely remarkable. This man had never walked before. Um, try to imagine a man without muscle tissue. Um, his nerves had at atrophied years ago. Uh, there's no nervous control of his ankles, of his toes, of his feet, etc., and so in this situation, since he had been crippled from, from birth, um, this is really an act of creation. And I can only imagine um, that there's a snap, crackle, and a pop going on here. I mean, this is, and this is, again, who's the human author of the book of Acts? Luke? What was Luke's profession? He was a doctor. So you know that his attention is evolved in this. So verse 9, it says, This man heard Paul speaking... And Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight in your faith. And he leaped and walked. Verse 9 is kind of interesting because it says that Paul observed that he had faith to be healed. What does that look like? I don't know. <laughs> you just look at somebody like, You've got faith to be healed. I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe it was discernment. You know, maybe he was able to discern, wow, this guy, I mean, maybe he communicated it to him. I don't know. But um, he's able to look at the guy and figure out that this guy has faith to be healed. It's real. It's, it's real to look at your life today and say in your life or in other people's situation, you know what, the God of the Bible says that healing is possible. And this guy took 
these words seriously. Now, what I love, though, is that if you look in verse 7 of chapter 14, um, it says that they were preaching the gospel there. What I love about Paul and Barnabas in this situation is that they don't really see themselves as miracle workers, but primarily they see themselves as preachers of the gospel. And it's so important to note, because that's where the power is, right? The power is in the word of God. The power is in the gospel. There are accounts of men like uh, C.T. Studd. <laughs> it just sounds manly. They cannot be explained apart from the power of God. When he was an evangelist, um, people would come to his meetings that were crippled, and before he prayed for them, he would break their wheelchairs, and he would break their crutches, and then he would pray for them, and they would be healed. Just want to suggest to you that if you feel like God is calling you to do that, make sure God is calling you to do that, because <laughs> you don't want to do that if you're not called. People who could hardly see, who wanted prayer for their eyes, he would take their glasses and he would crush them on the ground and then pray for them and their eyes were healed. Now this, this was actually a problem for the people that observed him doing this because they tried to do the same thing and they'd end up having to carry some people away. So, um, but again, what can't our God do? Because in this culture, for a man to be crippled from the womb, in a sense, that's an early death sentence. There was no Medicare back then. There were not wheelchair accessible ramps back then. And probably according to his estimation and maybe the, the deck that God had dealt him in his life, he, he was resolved to thinking, this is it. This is my life. For some reason, I'm unlucky, or maybe my parents were sinful. Who knows the different mental hoops that he jumped through in his life, and yet this guy had faith to be healed. Don't you want that kind of faith today? Man, I do. Because, again, as we get together each week, and we get together in, you know, in various parts of the room, and we're praying, as we're listening to what's going on in Mike's life and Mike's life and Tony's life and Bruce's life and Mark's life and my life. You know how I'm listening? I'm listening through the lens of faith. No matter what the situation is, no matter what the pain is, no matter what the bondage is, no matter what the struggle is, I'm thinking, okay, God, what can you do? And if we're obedient to pray and we honestly seek him, what can't God do to heal in our lives? So, Reading on, verse 11. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. This is unfortunate. <laughs> this is unfortunate for Paul and Barnabas, and this is unfortunate for the people. There's a reason, though, that they come to this conclusion. Historically, uh, well, I, before I get there, um, it's interesting, we have a historical, physical description of Paul written by a resident in Iconium. His name was uh, Anes Anesiphorus, yeah, something like that, Brother O. And uh, he, normally I can say that, this morning not so much. But he wrote that Paul was a man small in size. It says with meeting eyebrows, basically it means he had a unibrow, so he had a second mustache going on. A rather large nose, he was bald-headed, bow-legged, Strongly built, full of grace, for at times he looked like a man, and at times he had the face of an angel. What this tells me is that it's not based upon physical appearance. That there are times, and we see this in our culture, that we esteem man way too high. Okay? Well, let's see what happens. Verse 12. In Barnabas they called Zeus, <laughs> and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker, and then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. So I would say that this miracle that they did made an impression on some folks, okay? They think that the gods had arrived, but actually there were some old legends in the city of Lystra. And the legends went like this. They believed at one point that Zeus and Hermes came to their city and nobody gave him hospitality except for one elderly couple, Philemon and his wife. And it's not Philemon of the Bible. Because only one couple 
gave them hospitality, Zeus and Hermes destroyed the city except for the couple. So when they see this happen, this healing happen, they're like, okay, the gods are here. <laughs> you know, let's, let's have some fish sticks, honey. You know, prepare the mac and cheese. So, um, but th- these were legends. They were, they were superstitious, okay? But again, in our culture, don't we do the same thing? Magazines, headlines, movies, celebrities. We take people that, many of which regarding actors and celebrities, but even, even pastors, even spiritual leaders, we take these people and we hurt them by thinking that they're somehow different than we are. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that they're in a privileged position, okay? So here, you have a situation where, you know, they think probably because uh, Paul spoke that he was Hermes. Remember, Hermes was the messenger. And maybe Barnabas was a better looking guy. Who knows? Maybe he looked more dignified. I don't know. But how do we guard our hearts from that? You know? Because on the one hand, we should respect people that care about us spiritually, right? But at the same time, we have to be careful because spiritual leaders fall. And if we're not in a strong place and we don't have a strong foundation in the word of God, we can fall too, okay? So verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven in fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain from multitudes from sacrificing to them. Okay. Well, the first thing that they did was they tore their clothes. We know that that was a Jewish reaction to display blasphemy. Back then, clothing were a much bigger deal than it would be for us, okay? So right off the bat, their instant reaction is, number one, hey, we are not gods, and they rip their clothes, okay? So Jewish form of blasphemy, but also, too, they're letting them know, showing them, hey, we're flesh and blood just like you. But if I could, and and we need to get ready to prepare for communion here, um, I want to point out two things in verse 15. In saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should, one, turn from these useless things, that's called repentance, and two, turn to the living God. That's faith. Now, while you and I know that we do that in a salvation perspective, it doesn't stop there once you become born again, once you've been saved. In fact, think of it like driving, okay? And I speak mostly to men here. I'm, su- I'm sure it applies to women as well. You're driving. There's a scantily clad jogger or whatever, okay? You're driving, and you think, okay, I'm not going to look right? I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. I'm going to look, you know, three o'clock or whatever. Here's the problem. In a car, there is a rear view mirror, okay? And what that means is that not only do I need to not look as somebody's driving, but then again, the eyes and the heart connection, I need to not look in the rear view mirror. Because the bottom line is, is that what I look at today matters. Amen? What you look at matters. Not only that, that connection between my eyes and my heart means everything. And the truth of the matter is, when somebody comes through these doors here on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or any other time when they interact with any Christian, in a sense, they're having a hard experience because they're talking to us, they're interacting with us, And they have an opportunity to see our hearts right with Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you here this morning, gathered here together with friends and family, is that what I look at and what I allow myself to think about with my heart matters. 
And what I can do is I can do those two things. I can repent, I can turn, but I have to have the faith. And, and the interesting thing, other than if you're not an angel in the book of Revelation, you only have one set of eyes, right? So in order to be able to look at something, most of the time we have to be able to turn in that direction and look at that person. And it means we're not going to look back at those things. And the problem is here this morning is for you and I, there are things that we have looked at and we have allowed it to get into our hearts. And the good news here this morning is that that can change because we're getting ready to have communion, which is a hard, hard experience. I want to invite Tony and Mark at this point to come on stage as we prepare to worship. But I want to challenge you here this morning, and, and as we go into communion, I want to look at Psalm 69. As we do that, and, and I know this from talking to both men and women, there are times where there are things that we have looked at and we've allowed to stay in our hearts, and you think, this is not going to change. I find myself in the course of my week and I keep reviewing the things that are in my heart. I still have times and sometimes even when we're sleeping, you can have images or things that have happened in your life and they return to you. But I want to suggest to you this simple aspect here this morning before we start to worship. I want to ask the ushers to come forth to, to get the elements. What the living God affords for, uh, for you and I this morning is change, okay? Maybe more so for women, okay? Maybe it's not things that you've looked at that have been a problem with your heart. Maybe it's been things that you've allowed in the ear gate, okay? But regardless, where our hearts are at this morning is everything, okay? So right now, we're going to take an opportunity to... Uh, have elements passed out, but we're going to worship here. And I just want to invite you this morning to go to God and say, you know what, Lord? This is where my heart's been. I want to allow you the time to look at my heart and just find out where have I been. Amen? Let's worship. <laughs> 